Our next speaker is Dr. Andrew Frank. He is a cognitive and behavioral neurologist at Briere Memory Program. Uh, Dr. Frank will talk about updates on clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease, virtual reality, and GPS technology. And thank you, Dr. Frank, for joining us. And welcome to this presentation. Thank you, Herman, and uh, great to be with you this evening. Do I have control over the slides? Let's see. You can advance. So uh, most of my work over the last 15 years at uh, Briere, in addition to seeing patients, has been in being the site investigator for clinical trials, testing new treatments for Alzheimer's disease. As we all know, the treatments that we have for Alzheimer's disease are insufficient. Uh, the burden or the, the challenges for individuals and their family is significant. Uh, and we are in desperate need of new treatments. And the clinical trials unit uh, or clinical trials research unit at Briere has been doing clinical trials in the field of Alzheimer's disease for much longer than I've been at Briere, for over 25 years. And uh, since I've been here, we've been involved in multiple phase two and phase three, which are sort of final phase human clinical trials. Uh, testing medications for Alzheimer's disease in a double-blinded, meaning an individual does not know if they're on uh, placebo or not. And even the care team, our team, does not know if an individual is, in, is on a placebo or not. Um, Placebo-controlled, meaning that we are able to test a medication and try to control for the placebo effect. And this is considered sort of the highest level of evidence that we can collect to to know if a medication is working or not. Because we really only want medications that are working to be available to the public one day. And we've tested multiple oral and intravenous treatments over the years. And as you may have heard in the news, um, certainly over the past number of years, that the vast, vast majority of these trials have unfortunately been negative, meaning they have failed to show that these medications, which you see here, are any better than the placebo that they were tested against um, in a blinded and placebo-controlled fashion. And that has been very disappointing, of course, to uh, all of the individuals who are affected by this, by Alzheimer's disease, their families, of course, even our research team. It's been difficult to go through these failures one after another over these many, many years. It is obviously not for lack of trying, um, it is not even for lack of funding in a way in that these trials are partnerships between our hospital and many hospitals around the world with pharmaceutical companies uh, who have brought these new treatments forward. Um, again, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars being invested in uh, this condition for which the need is so great. And despite all of that, most, if not all of the ones you've seen here uh, have failed over these 15 years. But yet the work continues and the trials continue. Uh, in the sense that we can really never give up on the quest for new treatments for Alzheimer's because the need is only increasing ever more with every year. As the population continues to age, uh, the need for new treatments is even greater now than it's ever been and will continue to increase over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and so the hope to find new treatments um, uh, will never end and the trials will continue until we find something and hopefully more than one success over time. So at this moment, uh, we are still uh, involved in uh, clinical trials testing what are called anti-amyloid antibodies. Uh, you see a couple of strange names there, aducanumab, denanumab. Uh, these are intravenous treatments that enter, are given intravenously every month and enter the brain and try to remove the amyloid protein from the brain, which we still believe is what is damaging the brain and causing the memory loss of Alzheimer's disease. So we are trying to you know, modify the disease. We're trying to slow the disease. Uh, if we can't cure the disease, we want to at least slow it down so that individuals can live a long life 
uh, without ever having to develop the severe dementia, which is so debilitating to individuals and their families, uh, to allow people to live a full life without having to uh, really be, um, have their functioning robbed from them. And uh, again, many of these amyloid antibody, anti-amyloid antibodies have failed in clinical trials, but yet the, they remain in clinical trials even to this day. And we can touch a little bit later, perhaps in the um, questions session, that there has been some news lately in some of the current anti-amyloid treatments uh, that there may be some benefit uh, and we can touch on that a bit later, which again, renews the hope that there will be success in clinical trials and that we'll have new treatments for Alzheimer's uh, in the not too distant future. In addition to anti-amyloid antibody trials, uh, we are involved in other clinical trials, testing other medications, which are not intravenous. We have some oral medications as well, uh, which try to attack the disease from other angles. Uh, a sigma receptor agonist here uh, tries to reduce oxidative stress in the brain cells uh, and try to prevent them from being damaged or from dying, in fact, over time. A uh, TREM2 agonist here stimulates microglia, which are cells in the brain which uh, if we can go back one, cells in the brain that can clear proteins for us, and that's an intravenous treatment. Uh, there, you will see an OGA inhibitor, uh, also an oral treatment, which actually tries to prevent a second protein in the brain called tau from aggregating. Uh, and we're also involved in transcranial infrared light therapy, which is believed that such light can travel through the skull and again, stimulate clearance of proteins, because we still believe that Alzheimer's disease at its core uh, is an accumulation of proteins in the brain, which starts to damage the brain. And so again, there is this great hope that one day we're going to find some either intravenous or oral treatments or both, which can significantly interfere with this biochemistry in the brain so that people can live a full life, even with these conditions present, that they can still live a full life without having to experience the worst symptoms of Alzheimer's or dementia. So moving beyond the clinical trials, which have been underway for so long, uh, we are, uh, I'm also involved, like my colleagues who have spoken tonight in terms of finding technologies which can help us uh, with the condition while we wait for new treatments to be developed. For example, is it possible to develop a computerized memory test? And so we've been, for many years, we've been working on uh, with the creators of this product, which is a computerized cognitive test in which there are playing cards shown on an iPad, uh, where you simply have to press yes if, a, uh, if you see a red card and no if it's a black card. Uh, press yes if you've seen the card before in the series that are being shown, and press yes if it is the same card that was just shown before. So essentially, on an iPad, it's a computerized memory test that flips cards um, and requires you to try to remember if you've seen the card before. The goal being to finding a more sensitive test for memory loss. Because yes, uh, we use paper-based tests, as we mentioned before, but what if there are more um, specific or sensitive tests that can be done on a computer like this one, which can actually detect memory loss earlier, more reliably than the traditional paper-based test that we've been using for decades? Uh, we'd love it if the computer can predict that earlier. So next slide. If we just look at the test, have you seen this card before, you can really sense that that might test short-term memory. Here we showed uh, in an early analysis that those individuals who were destined to get worse with their memory seem to also be getting worse with that particular card game of, have you seen this card before? Now, we are still collecting data on this trial, and we hope to have much more data over a much longer period of time to see if this task, have you seen this card before, yes or no, can predict people's decline years in advance, possibly two or three years in advance. That's what we want the most, Some, something that any one of us could try on an iPad to try to predict the future, telling us 
two or three years in advance if we are destined to get worse with our memory. And we're hoping that a computer technology can do that. We are working on virtual reality. If, if you've never heard of this before, it's a kind of technology where you wear a computer screen on your face, where there's a screen in front of you, where there are uh, uh, speakers that are playing um, voice or music into your ear, and even microphones in the goggle to try to hear what you're saying. So by wearing these goggles, you are basically immersed in a virtual environment around you. For individuals in long-term care, uh, nursing home, there can be significant social isolation, especially during the pandemic. So if it's, is it possible to wear a goggle such as this to place you in a new environment, like sitting at a beach, for example, and hearing the waves, or in a forest and hearing the birds? All of that is possible, and work has been done to show that many people enjoy such a immersive experiences uh, and that this may decrease the sense of isolation being in a nursing home. We uh, would like to take this one step further and are trying to develop what's called a virtual companion. That is this, this lady uh, who we've named Kira is a, a computer generated companion that is presented in the virtual reality goggles to try to provide a source of socialization and companionship to individuals who are in long-term care. This virtual companion um, can hear what is being said through by an individual through microphones in the goggles uh, and can then speak back to an individual uh, through speakers in the, um, in the goggles and can potentially carry on a conversation so that this uh, Kira, her name, Kira, can ask questions of an individual, try to elicit conversation and reminiscences, and then provide feedback um, as part of conversation to the individual. We're looking very closely into what's called artificial intelligence conversation generation, where a computer can try to understand what is being said by a person and try to generate appropriate responses to try to keep the conversation going. Our dream, of course, is to have this application in long-term care so that those individuals who are isolated will have someone to speak to. This doesn't, of course, replace a real person, but this may provide another source of socialization that could improve quality of life. We are looking to GPS technology. As we know, those individuals, individuals with dementia can wander from their home and this can become very hazardous to their health, especially if it's nighttime or wintertime or both, in the sense that some, in, some individual, individuals may become lost outside at night or in the winter where their health may be compromised and this could well be fatal as it has been in some individuals who are, have wandered from their home. Many of these trackers have a very limited battery life of just three to five days. Like our phone, they have GPS tracking, but they need to be charged every few days. Um, and this may not be a successful solution because an in, uh, device such as this may be char being charged and not being worn at a time when a person needs it most when they wander from their home. So we have set out to find a GPS tracker which has a much longer battery life. And so an alternate low power GPS system was unveiled by um, Apple, the maker of the iPhone in 2021, in which it is possible to track individuals in the community using low power non GPS technology through Bluetooth connections. And I know that some of these uh, technological terms may not be familiar to everyone, but um, it is possible to use this new Bluetooth system unveiled by Apple last year to track individuals in the community um, through Bluetooth or low power connections anonymously by other strangers in the community who have iPhones. So as long as an, using this system, as long as an individual is near an iPhone, they can be tracked anonymously through other people's phones. Inter amazingly in a private manner. So even though information is being used from through other people's phones, uh, there is no actual loss of privacy. And it is our hope to try to incorporate this technology with traditional GPS technology to try to lower the power 
requirements for a GPS tracker in the community so that it may be possible using this technology to extend a battery life of a tracker from just days to possibly months. And we are also working on a design to have this tracker on a person's risk at all times. Uh, since the battery life is so long, we hope to have a wrist device which keeps this device on an individual at all times, even when they're being bathed with a waterproof design, so that this could be on a person at all times, especially when they need it most when they are wandering, even if it's nighttime, and that it may only need to be charged every few months. That means it's there on the person when they need it most. And we hope that not only will this improve quality of life, but this may save lives as well. And again, we're thankful for our collaborations. As you've seen with our other, with my colleagues tonight, there is a, a massive amount of collaboration which are with our partners, such as Carleton University, uh, to, to actually design and create this technology. And we are, in fact, um, collaborating with the University of Ottawa as well for um, a microbiome project. This will be my last project to present to you, uh, in which is actually looking at the microbiome. If you've never heard of that, it's the bacteria which live in our bowels, which, of course, help with digestion. But more than that, they actually release transmitters that enter the bloodstream and may travel all the way to the brain and create a link, if you will, between the gut and the brain, promoting not only bowel health, but also brain health as well. All mediated by bacteria that are living in our bowels, which are in fact very helpful and do not represent an infection, but rather an essential part of our body. This project looks at what are called prebiotics. Now, you may have heard of probiotics. That's where we eat more of the bacteria, like in yogurt, to actually replenish the bacteria in our bowels. And that is very normal. Prebiotics are a little different. These are sort of foods that are eaten by the bacteria in our bowels. So we're, a prebiotic, if we eat that, are not digestible to us. And they're not bacteria, but they are foods that eventually reach our bowels and actually feed the bacteria that are there. In doing so, we try to promote the bacteria in our bowels that we want the most and, you know, try to discourage the growth of the bacteria in our bowels that we don't want, that are not helpful. So in this way, we're trying to manipulate and encourage a healthy microbiome. And in doing so, is it possible that having a healthier microbiome that we are able to encourage, could this actually help brain health? Could this actually help memory? So this project, which aims to recruit 40 individuals with mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia due to Alzheimer's, we are going, with our partners at uh, University of Ottawa, we are, gonna we are going to screen a stool sample with, to determine what their microbiome is currently. And then from that, we will determine the optimal prebi prebiotic that they need to encourage the growth that we are hypothesizing will be beneficial to them. This individual will then receive either this prebiotic orally uh, by mouth or a placebo once again in this double-blinded placebo-controlled fashion. Just as I described for the clinical trials that we're doing, once again, this is the only true way to determine if an intervention is helping uh, to overcome the placebo effect, to give an individual the active treatment or a placebo such that they do not know if they're getting the active or the placebo, and even our care team will not know, meaning double-blinded, uh, if they've got the active treatment or placebo so in that way to prevent any sort of bias in uh, both participant and in our team to try to get the most accurate determination uh, of is this treatment, be it a clinical trial or a prebiotic, does it actually help? Over three months in this case, next slide, to see if over three months they improve their memory if they or stabilize their memory, if they have any adverse effects in terms of their bowel habits, 
And yes, we'll be measuring the stool sample once again, which I know does, that, does not sound pleasant, but it is part of this study to measure the stool sample at the beginning and at the end to see if this prebiotic food for the bacteria will alter the bacteria and help memory. Thank you so much for listening to all of our presentations. Um, I think we have Nadine on the line as well, who could speak more to our uh, clinical trials unit, as I mentioned, uh, involved in drug trials and technology trials. You've heard all about them tonight. Uh, and we are immensely thankful to all of the families and participants who have been part of our research over these so many years of so many different research platforms as you've heard um, and because it we, we appreciate that it takes time to do the memory testing uh, to do brain scans to take medications orally to to be given medications intravenously uh, to be part of uh, technology studies with sensors and and driving simulators um, and 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 uh, memory techniques um, all of that is we know that that takes time and we are tremendously thankful uh, for everyone's participation and our dream as you've heard tonight is to find interventions that really help uh, and improve quality of life